Welcome to Screens of the Stone Age, the podcast where scientists review movies about prehistoric people. My name is Joshua Lindell. I'm a grad student studying Neanderthal teeth, and I'm here with... I'm Kim Fobb. I am a bioarchaeologist who studies human evolution and the health and disease in the past. And I'm Ross Barnett, a uh, paleogeneticist, mainly looking at uh, Ice Age cats. And today we're reviewing the movie The Valley of Guanji from 1969. I... Remember that at the end of the last episode, we said we were going to start reviewing better movies, and we talked about Jurassic Park, even though it's kind of off topic for our podcast. And then for some reason, after we stopped recording, we settled on The Valley of Guanji, which I feel is kind of cowboy Jurassic Park, uh, but it's not Jurassic Park. So I'm not sure why this is the one we decided on, Ross. I feel like that was your idea. Uh, I think I just wanted more stop motion dinosaurs. I think that's really what it was all about. Uh, But I've I've never seen this. I've never seen this film before, but I've heard good things about it. And I I think it was certainly for the time, it was probably quite a good film. I enjoyed it. Uh, And I think it's not the worst one we've seen so far. No, it's not the worst for sure. Uh, Who wants to summarize this one? I think Kim could go for it. (laughs) Okay, I'll try. Um, This one, a lot happened though. Well, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> it was kind of an emotional roller coaster. Too many horses and too many dinosaurs were hurt in the making of this movie. <laughs> so, in Mexico, south of the Rio Grande, they're very clear to say, um, there's this Wild West circus type show thing. And so they've been doing it for a while and it's not going very well. They're not making money anymore. And then this handsome cowboy Ken doll shows up. And he has obviously been associated with them before. He was the lover of the cowgirl in the West Wild West show. They're obviously not getting along anymore. They've broken up. There's some fighting. And then they get back together. And she, so when they're back together, she shows him this new act that she's put together. So her, her original act is that she rides this poor horse up three stories of this wooden staircase and then makes it jump in a pool of water surrounded by fire. It was horrible poor horse so that's the big show uh so no wonder they weren't doing very well and then um so she shows him her new act which is a tiny tiny little horse which when she shows him to him looks like um like it's probably 10 centimeters high or so 15 centimeters high like it's very tiny and her idea is to put it in like a snow globe type of thing and put it on the back of a regular horse and have it dance because she's trained it to dance to music on top of a horse, a regular sized horse, and that's going to be their new show. And then the Ken doll is like, oh my goodness, we can make so much money selling this tiny horse to Bartum Bailey. Is that right? Bartum and Bailey mm-hmm. and Wild Bill, um, the big guys at that time. And um, he also goes out, I don't remember if this was before or after he sees the little horse. I think is before he goes out into the desert um, and he meets a paleontologist who is alone for some reason doing field work in Mexico trying to find the oldest hominoid which he says is human like creatures which he thinks he says that most paleontologists think that they date to uh, 1 million years old but he wants to prove that they date to at least 50 million years old he's chosen he uses 50 million years throughout the entire movie as this like everything happens before or after 50 million years and he shows this fossil that has the um, footprints of a miniature horse, the dwarf, um, what was it called, Ross? Not a dwarf Eohibis. horse. The, um, Eohibis. Yeah, well, he called it something, though. It was um, Dawn, Dawn horse. horse. The Dawn Horse, yeah. So, like, yeah. one of the first horses, which was really tiny and, and is about 50, 50 million years ago, if I'm right. But its footprints is in the same fossil as what he was saying was a hominoid tibia, which it, it was not. And so he thinks that that dates the hominoid tibia to being at least 50 million years old. And then, so then the Ken doll shows the paleontologist the tiny horse. And he's like, you mean this horse? And then the paleontologist is like, oh my God, we need to study for science. And Ken doll's like, no, we're going to need to make money. And then the paleontologist is like, well, what if we find where the horses are? Then we could both do it for science and make even more money because we can find more horses. And then all throughout this, there is a group of uh, Romani who know about the Valley of the Guanji and um, 
say that if you remove the horse like they did, or you remove any animal from that valley, so the Forbidden Valley, then death and destruction is going to come to the town. And so they're really unhappy that the little horse is there. So the paleontologist sets it up so that, because they know where the Forbidden Valley is, and they're not going to tell anybody. So he sets it up so that they go take the horse and then bring it back to the Forbidden ha- um, Valley. So then the paleontologist and the Kendall can follow them to see where this Forbidden Valley is. And then once the circus people find out that they stole the horse, they all go. So then it ends up just being this whole group, big group of people. Well, all men. And then the one cowgirl who go into this valley. And then there's dinosaurs. Um, there's a pterosaur. I think it, what I thought was an allosaur that could have tried to be a T-Rex. And yeah, so they have to fight a bunch of dinosaurs. And then they leave. Finally, they can leave the valley. There's no more horses. We never hear or even think about the horse again. And they leave the valley. And then the Allosaurus chases them out of the valley. Um, It gets hurt because there's a rock fall as it's trying to get out of the valley. So then they tie it up with some rope and some twigs. And that somehow keeps it contained. And then they take it to the circus. And then the Romanis are really upset. So they, um, one of them undoes the cage that the Allosaurus is in. So the Allosaurus gets out and then it's all chaos as everybody runs screaming from the theater. And then the the Allosaurus does a rampage through the town. And then everybody runs into the church, which is the only building in the village that has high enough doors and ceilings for the Allosaurus to just easily walk into. So then everybody has to run out of the church and then they trap the Allosaurus in the church and then the church lets on fire and the Allosaurus die. And that's it. And it just sort of ends abruptly on that. Yeah. <laughs> it was really sad. I mean, that poor Allosaurus didn't do anything but exist. And eat several people. Well, okay, but they were asking for it. <laughs> yeah, and, like, you can't blame true. it for doing that. It was just doing Allosaurus shit. Mm. If they had just left it alone. Yeah, they hadn't, like, stomped into its valley and uh, tried shooting it. Yeah, and then kidnapping it and then taking it and... So, do we want to stick with our format and start off with the uh, inaccuracies? <laughs> Dinosaurs and humans don't exist at the same time. But this is different because it's not a caveman movie with cavemen living with dinosaurs. It's mm-hmm. uh, dinosaurs that have survived in a secret valley for yeah. 50 million years, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not the setup that they're going for isn't technically inaccurate. They're kind of proposing a lost world kind of scenario where this valley, which seems to be, you know, slap bang in the middle of, of Mexico, uh, with with nothing particularly to isolate it, has been isolated for sixty six million years and still has um, very scientifically inaccurate dinosaurs roaming around, and mm-hmm. somehow and also uh, Eohippus. Yeah. So Eohippus is from what fifty million years ago, the tiny horses. I guess. Yeah. Five? That that kind of time periods are uh, after the dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. There would be absolutely no reason why any reputable um, paleontologist or archaeologist would be looking for human ancestors of 50 million years old, especially not in Mexico. For sure, yeah. But we we don't actually know that he was reputable. He was only <laughs> ever true. working alone. We never see anybody else <laughs> talking. He's not working with any other professionals in in his field. Yeah, he does a lot of drinking and not a lot of paleontology, which is possibly quite... Uh, <laughs> Not inaccurate. No, inaccurate, exactly. I don't know why they had to make him be looking for a humanoid at 50 million. Like, why not just be looking for the horse? That yeah. was enough on itself, right? Yeah. And the, the humanoid aspect never came up again. And it also, his, his humanoid theory that he goes on about is totally buggered by, you know, the fact that they, they find living uh, Eohippus. I mean, that means yeah. that, that his fossil, in inverted commas, could have come from any time up until like last week, because uh, <laughs> yeah. their whole premise is that Eohippus is around until the modern day. Then mm-hmm. you know that's that's useless as a as a kind of datable fossil. That's not a. And the mud is even still wet. Can you believe it? <laughs> After Fifty million years. But he keeps saying that number, even when he's talking about the dinosaurs. He's like, the dinosaurs haven't been around for fifty million years. Like he just keeps. That's the only number he knows. So yeah, it is a big number. Variable. I mean, it's it's a it good is, one to know. It's not quite big enough for dinosaurs mm. and too big for hum- humanoids. We've talked about this when we were, we were watching old movies before, but uh, uh, I was wondering what the state of paleontology was in 1969. 
Because for my whole life, we've known 65 million years is when the dinosaurs went extinct. But when did we actually learn that? Because we didn't even have radio, radiometric dating until the 1950s. So in 1969, did they have the date of 65 million years for the, the KT extinction? Or like, when did we get that date? I think they did. I mean, didn't they have it like back in like close to Victorian age with sedimentology dating? But they didn't have any uh, frame of reference, so they didn't have any absolute dates, right? Because they didn't get that until radiometric dating, right? Mm. Am I wrong about that? Uh, Well, I mean, there are kind Mm. of uh, non-radiometric methods of getting absolute dates, um, but they're they're only particularly good for, uh, I think, for mostly recent stuff, kind of maybe even ice age, so things like um, study of varves and endocrinology and stuff. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that, and that's something I'd be interested to find out. When did mm. sort of sixty-five? Although now I'm seeing more and more sources put uh, sixty-six uh, million years. Mm-hmm. When did that become the kind of standard uh, accepted uh, kind of split point between end Cretaceous beginning uh, Triassic? Well, I mean, I for the know. listeners, the farther we back, the farther back we get in time, the bigger the error bars are, mm-hmm. and the bigger the more acceptable large error bars are. So if you're talking 65 million years ago, and it was actually between 66 and 64, th- that doesn't really matter, right? For sure. I mean, uh, you can see that in your everyday life. It's like, very easy to, to know what were you doing at 12 o'clock last Tuesday. But if you ask somebody, what were you doing at, at 12 o'clock on the sort of 3rd of January 1999, then that, that's much mm-hmm. more difficult to, to mm-hmm. get good error bars on, on, on that kind of statement that's something that a lot of these movies that are comedies uh joke about right like uh the last movie started off uh setting it at one zillion bc october 9th where they sort of (laughs) combine this level of like this vague time range with a very specific arbitrary date yeah Hmm. but uh, yeah i really like the eohibis the el diablo is what they called it i mean they did a really good job i thought yeah, it was really nice. I mean, it's a Ray Harryhausen uh, creation, and it's beautiful. But it was a bit weird, you know. El Diablo is Spanish for the Diablo or the Devil. I know the <laughs> Devil. I know it. And you know, it's it doesn't look couldn't look any less devilish. This delightful little miniature miniature horse uh, that just sort of prances around and looks cute. I know, and they tr- they teach it to dance to like um, a jewelry box chime. <laughs> <laughs> and then call it El Di- Diablo. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was weird too. It, it makes sense that the Romani witch lady would call it the devil because she's the one prophesizing this evil coming out of this valley. But then it's very weird for the circus to advertise it as a devil when it's a mm-hmm. cute little horse. But mm-hmm. like the circus was using El Diablo in their own branding for it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. That's the part that I thought was weird. Yeah. And I mean, it. It's clearly it's uh, off its time. This film, I, I think, it's weird that the kind of stereotypes of the of the Romani characters in the film are bizarre as well. I mean, they don't particularly make sense. Why uh, some Romani people would know about a secret valley in Mexico, uh, but not, for instance, say Native Mexicans that, that have lived there for you know ten thousand years? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that feeds into kind of stereotypes of the time about you know secret knowledge and things like that. Her being psychic and having powers. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, that's quite strange. Yeah, we can talk about the problematic mm-hmm. aspects of this movie that are of its time. Like we're calling them Romani, but of course they call them gypsies throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. They also have uh, part of the circus. Uh, the movie starts out with um, a reenactment of a cowboy and Indian war, and they call them Indians throughout the movie as well. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you looked up any of the actors, but uh, there's this uh, young boy. Uh, Lupe Lope, who plays a prominent role in the movie, but uh, he was born in England, <laughs> clearly uh, overdubbed with a uh, with a uh, uh, Hispanic accent, and uh, pretty sure that a lot of the characters are in brownface in this movie because mm-hmm. most of them are English actors. Yeah, that is pretty. Quite and there's there's quite a lot of really uh, bad overdubbing as well. Like the the, the cowgirl character TJ, uh, mm-hmm. it's really really noticeable how badly she's been overdubbed all the way through. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I kind of looked up some of the actors afterwards and, and I think I read somewhere she was Israeli 
I think, or or she'd grow, grown up in Israel. So, um, but they they decided to overdub her accent, uh, so we never actually hear her speak. Hmm. We just hear that the kind of dubbing all all throughout, and it doesn't match up with the mouth movements particularly well. But she has an American accent in the movie too. Yeah, I, I was really freaked out by the the main character Tuck. I mean, th- this is very much a film of its time where you know men are men and women are dames, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And he's quite, he looks exactly like Charlton Heston. And so when he kind of turned up on screen, I thought, oh, wow, I didn't realize Charlton Heston was in this, but it's no, not I Charlton Googled, Heston. I would, yeah, no, it's not. He, he's just like a, he's an own brand, Charlton Heston, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That, was, that was quite disconcerting. He does look like Ken come to life, though. Like if Ken were to come to life, that would be him. And be a horrible misogynist. With a smile and everything. Yeah. Yes. One thing I noticed, um, kind of at the end of the movie, when they were, when the whole group went into the valley, the second was a more Sorry. Motorcycle. Without a muffler. Um, when they all went into the valley, all the men are wearing, like, their dirty cowboy clothes, Right. And they didn't bring bags except for with water and stuff. So they're all wearing their dirty cowboy clothes. But she changes outfits, pants, tops, scarf, everything. She changes outfits. <laughs> I did not notice that, but that's, that's a good I catch. Did, yeah. <laughs> other, I mean, obviously, the other mistakes are having uh, kind of tertiary and uh, Mesozoic animals together. So dinosaurs and Eohippus doesn't really make yeah. sense. Having no. uh, kind of a whole mix of things like the dinosaurs they have pteranodon which is a pterosaur flying reptile but they have uh allosaurus i think i think you're right kim i think it's an allosaurus i noticed it had three fingers rather than mm-hmm. the two which t-rex has so i think it's meant to be an mm-hmm. allosaurus they have a styracosaurus which is the kind of uh which is a ceratopsid so um like triceratops but it's only got one horn and lots of mm-hmm. spikes on its actual frill i don't know exactly if those guys were around at the same time possibly um, it's got uh, some kind of small theropod, which is one of the things that's seen at the beginning. Something like I thought it was uh, a, a galli- gallimimus or something. Yeah, gallimimus like, or, or coelophysis like or, yeah. or something like that. And they've yeah. got a kind of uh, sluggish um, sauropod, the kind of long-necked, which could be platosaurus or saltosaurus or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, they're all really cool. I think the the snot motion dinosaurs have a lot of character. <laughs> the the what when I imagine kind of dinosaurs in films, that I always think of the kind of Harryhausen ones. And um, what's really bad is the kind of split between how amazing the stop motion Pteranodon looks, and then when they kind of are wrestling the rubber version on screen. <laughs> so the the the, the Pteranodon steals uh, Lope, I think it kind of carries him off, trying to take it back to his nest. Then it kind of gets tired for no reason and drops him. <laughs> and then the cowboys come in and it just lays down. It just yeah, lays just, down. Oh, I've had enough. Um, yeah get me out of this film and all the cowboys come in uh, and I, I don't think they shoot them but they he he does some kind of cowboy steer wrestling on it and ends up breaking it its, its neck, neck. yeah know, it so sad but when but it's it looks in the so air, rubbery so, i know <laughs> but the, all the dinosaurs change color depending on which angle you looked at them so when they most of the time they're purple like bright purple and kind of sparkly but then when they're in the same frame as the humans or you know when they're wrestling the humans they turn like blacky gray rubbery yeah so funny. I don't know why they would have made them purple. I also didn't understand why this uh, Styracosaurus kept coming around. It was like this. It's like he wanted to keep, eat the humans too, but it doesn't make sense because he's a herbivore. But like, why would he just keep coming to check out what the Allosaurus was doing until the Allosaurus killed it? I mean, the valley looks like it's probably quite a boring place to live. So you know, any kind yes. of new stimuli uh, and no be... food source for the herbivores. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's not a very high body count in this film. Uh, I don't think anyone dies until after the halfway mark when they're in the valley. Yeah. The, just the, what, the two, Allosaurus two eats someone, I think. Eats Carlos, doesn't it? Uh, the cowboy Carlos girls doesn't eat someone before interest. that, too. Yeah. Does he eat someone before that? Well, Carlos' brother, Miguel, right in the opening scene, dies trying to get the Eohippus out of uh, the valley, right? So, okay. And mm. then the, the Romani witch commented that both brothers, she prophesied that both of them would die or something like that. Yeah. Right. But he could have just been having a bad day. We don't know that he was attacked by the dinosaur. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Heart attack or something. Yeah. Heat stroke. And then the Allosaurus killed 
uh, one or two villagers at Rom- the Romani guy that opened the cage and then a villager. But if you notice yeah. every time when he, so it would have them in its mouth and he would kind of like look around and then he just gently put him, put the body on the ground and walk away. It was so sweet. <laughs> Yeah, but the, I mean, the kind of highlight of the film, I think, is when they they lasso the Allosaurus, uh, and, yeah. and they're they're showing all their kind of cowboy skills lassoing this Allosaurus. I don't know particularly why. I mean, they, they, the the kind of ethos of the film is I I wrote this down this quote because it kind of summed it up. It's when they first see uh, the the dinosaurs in the in the Valley of the Guanji. I think it's Tuck. His first words are, "Let's get him for the show." So they they, yeah. they discover this you know, amazing forgotten world full of dinosaurs and other kind of wondrous creatures and their first thought is how can we make money from this yeah and that that's Which really these, is what these humans are supposed to be the though. good guys wow well, i don't know if he's a good guy i mean <laughs> even even at before he when he was um before he went to find the little horse after it was stolen he said like he was sitting there debating whether he steals the horse from his love interest and makes money or whether he tells her about how much money he could do so that they could make money together. And he was he hadn't made up his mind yet what he was going to do. Well, we've talked about in lots of movies with animals how the animal's behavior doesn't make any sense, especially for the predators where they're just mm-hmm. sort of killing machines and they go from one person to the next constantly killing, whereas a predator would, you know, attack something and if it kills it, it'll eat it and then it'll be full and it won't really be interested in killing more. And also how... Uh, predators won't expend that much energy to catch something like mm-hmm. this allosaurus chases the humans all the way like to its own downfall trying to escape this little cave and causes a collapse mm-hmm. and gets himself crushed trying so hard to get every last human whereas you know it would it had already eaten a dinosaur before it even started attacking the humans so it probably wouldn't have bothered with them right yeah. It ate two dinosaurs. It ate the right. dinosaur too. So yeah, yeah. So it uh, it uh, it might be like you say the 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 ethos of the whole movie is the humans immediately see the dinosaurs and like let's catch it. So I feel like maybe the 1960s mentality of humans dominating mm. uh, nature is projected onto the animals, mm-hmm. and so the animals are just interested in dominating the humans. Possibly, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I'm not sure where that idea comes from. Well, yeah. probably makes us feel better that we're not abnormal in that. <laughs> um, one of my favorite parts was when the Allosaurus was trying to break through outside of the, the valley, and then there is the rock slide, and then it goes from being like that that animated dinosaur to a very obvious tiny little <laughs> plastic toy that just gets yeah. <laughs> thrown down I think in I the had dirt. that toy as a kid. I think that was <laughs> yeah. like the, the kind of classic kind of T-Rex uh, monopause model that everyone had. And they just, yeah. oh, it'll do. It's fine. <laughs> and then when they're trying to have it still be alive before they changed it, so it was still the rubber thing, and then they just made, like, sleeping noises, like... <sighs> <laughs> they're sort of gently rocking the entire model a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To make it look like it's breathing. Yeah, this is the type of movie that I was hoping Caveman and stuff would be, would be like, where it's enjoyable, even yeah. if it's terrible, right? It's so bad it's good, not so bad yeah. it's just really bad. Yeah. yeah, I quite enjoyed it. Yeah, I did too. Uh, I mean, even for all of its many, many faults. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting that it seemed to, I mean, it's very much a kind of, you can see the influences of Jurassic Park in there, not just in the kind of theme of, you know, uh, capturing a dinosaur and it going horribly wrong and it eating the kind of locals. But even some mm-hmm. of the shots were kind of amazing uh, kind of pre uh, preconceptions of, of what ends up in Jurassic Park. Yeah, I thought that too. So the one that kind of really struck home was that when the, uh, where is it? When the Allosaurus uh, escapes first and comes out of the, the kind of um, uh, bull ring where, where the, the circus show is, it's kind of roaring around underneath a, a big banner which says, you know, the Great Guanji or, or something like that, which is really kind of reminded me totally of uh, the end of Jurassic Park where you have the T-Rex uh, kind of roaring away underneath the, the huge banner that's falling down that says when dinosaurs ruled the earth. So, I, yep. I mean, I'm sure that must be a deliberate throwback from Jurassic Park, uh, in Jurassic Park, to this film. I mean, it's kind of too much of a coincidence to be otherwise, I think. Um, but yeah, it, it's kind of, it's almost like a, you know, a missing link between uh, the, the King Kong of the 30s and Jurassic Park of the 90s. It's sort of halfway between and has aspects of, of both, uh, I think, on the way. 
There's another yeah. scene that I thought must have directly inspired a scene in Jurassic Park when uh, they're chasing that uh, Struthiomimus or Gallimimus or whatever it is. Uh, and then it sort of gets beyond them, but then the T-Rex or the Allosaurus sort of ambushes surprisingly from off screen and, uh, attacks and kills this, uh, whatever Gallimimus or whatever, it was a Gallimimus in Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. Uh, but like the, the emotions of that Tyrannosaurus biting it and then sort of shaking it and then dropping it and then picking down at it looks exactly like the way the Tyrannosaurus does in Jurassic Park. So. Mm -hmm. I feel like they must have been watching this for inspiration and, and must have used some of the scenes directly uh, when they were making Jurassic Park. Yeah. So this is not supposed to be a podcast about dinosaurs. And uh, <laughs> when I started watching this movie, I'm like, cool, it's a dinosaur movie. I like dinosaurs, but I'm not sure what we're going to talk about. And then in the first scene where we meet uh, the paleontologist, he says a few little things there. And I'm like, oh, great. We might have some material. And they kind of... Uh, lose it pretty quickly after that but uh <laughs> some things that i liked are um he's introduced as an archaeologist and he corrects him and says well kind of i'm actually a paleontologist and i'm like oh that's a nice distinction for 1969 that was great i mean we could do with that today i mean the number of times you hear news articles where they confuse the the two totally separate fields mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh then he also starts talking about eohippus and i'm like oh great it's uh uh, tertiary mammals that's much closer to what uh, we should actually be talking about even though it's you know 45 million years before humans but mm -hmm. uh still slightly closer than dinosaurs it's a, ma it's a mammal though so it's a mammal yeah it's not a dinosaur mm -hmm. uh but then as soon as the dinosaurs show up we forget about eohippus we immediately forget about this humanoid or hominoid or whatever he says humanoid theory yeah. Uh, I was kind of hoping we were going to find some uh, strange early evolved people in this valley, but uh, no, they just totally abandoned that as soon as the dinosaurs show up, never come back to it at all. So I was a little bit disappointed about that. I know. Which, I don't know why they had it in there at, at any point then. <laughs> I didn't think about it, but Ross, like you said, if Eohippus has been alive the entire time, then that's just a modern human tibia that he found yeah. with a recent <laughs> Eohippus fossil. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, he's quite a good caricature of a of a paleontologist. I, I wrote down one of the quotes, which was definitely something that uh, a paleontologist would say, where he he uh, he says, "We'll see what the Royal Society has to say about this," which is a, yeah. a kind of great angry quote. <laughs> it was that stupidity is the cornerstone of your existence. <laughs> if we should have introduced those two characters. Uh, they'd have got along fantastically, I think. <laughs> Uh, this this paleontologist was much more pleasant. He was a oh yeah funny bumbling character rather than a, a mad scientist. Yeah, and he does seem pretty crestfallen when uh, when he discovers this hominoid theory is is utter garbage and, and never mentions it again. <laughs> <laughs> and d d does he survive to the end? Um, uh, the last note I have is of him being squished underneath the the remains of the Allosaurus cage when it es escapes. But does he survive? Do we see him after? No, that I think point? that's the last we see it. That's the last. That's oh, oh dear. Yeah. yeah, it ends pretty abruptly, and it doesn't really tie up anything. I was, I was hoping for at least a line, like uh, you know, like there's that short monologue at the end of uh, the Neanderthal Man where he <laughs> tells us some lesson about hubris or whatever the lesson of that movie was. <laughs> and I'm like, I like uh, Tuck is going to have some line. He's, he's going to sum this up about how humans are the real monster for trying to capture this innocent dinosaur but no the church burns down they're like standing there like they're gonna say something and then it says the end and then that's it <laughs> yeah well the little boy cries which I, I think that's true the little boy cries but is he crying over the church or is he crying over the dinosaur that's it, not really very clear Oh, I assumed it was the dinosaur. <laughs> uh, but, that, but I think you're just yeah. projecting your own emotions yeah, onto, the, onto the character. <laughs> and you know, what a weird church. This, this kind of podunk little place is tiny. I know. But it's got this enormous cathedral, which seems to be sort of under construction still, with what mm -hmm. money I don't know. And they just happen to have you know, multi-level mezzanines inside and kind of spears hanging around. I mean, I've never been mm -hmm. in a church that ha has spears. Maybe they do things different <laughs> south of the Rio Grande. I don't know. Well, did you guys 
see any symbolism in this uh, church fire scene, because at first we have the Eohippus, which is called El Diablo, and then the dinosaur, which is not El Diablo, but it comes from the same evil valley, dies in a fire being locked in a church. So we have some evil devil character Mm. in a church burning down, and that's the conclusion. And I'm like, I feel like they're trying to say something symbolic here, but I couldn't quite put together exactly what the message was. Uh, yeah. Or was there a message? Whether that the humans did what they weren't supposed to do and now the church is burning? Or is it that the dinosaur, the church had to just, like God had to destroy the dinosaur, which was a problem. There was a woman in the crowd who made like the sign of the cross as she was watching it burn. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I was I think too emotionally involved in Gwandi's demise. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was crying for so long. Is really sad. Definitely emotionally ev- involved in in these poor animals in the circus. It's like even you've talked yeah. about the the real horses they used in this movie, and they're constantly falling. And I like, oh, I wonder how many horses died in the making of this movie. But I I said out loud halfway through the movie, like I am so not emotionally invested in this uh, romance subplot. <laughs> no, no, because it's not really romance. And then at the end, when she decides, like. Yes, we are going to make money because she was going. She wanted to leave the circus and go and be with him. Is what she wanted until they got the Allosaurus, and then she's like, "No, we can make big bucks, and I can be super famous by being the woman who rides the Allosaurus." Um, and then he was like, "What about moving to the ranch and being together and leaving all this?" And she was like, "No, I don't want to anymore. Now I want to do this, and then we can do that later." And then he was like, "No, it's my way or the highway." And then she was like, "Yeah, they're both pretty terrible people, I think." <laughs> Uh, but he he's particularly obnoxious. Yeah, he'd been waffling on commitment the whole way through. She's like, yeah. why did you leave me? And he's like, I couldn't be tied down. And she's like, what about now? And he's like, well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, maybe some kids? And he's like, oh, I guess so. Maybe. <laughs> and then like, at some point he decides, you know what? You've convinced me. We're going to go live on a ranch and have kids. And she's like, well, maybe I want to stay at the circus with this dinosaur. And he's like, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. How did you like them apples? Yeah. <laughs> we could talk about the actual real life big news in dinosaur paleontology this week. Have you guys heard about the new Tyrannosaurus? Yeah. Oh, you know, buy it? I don't know. I mean, it it seems like a huge amount of publicity for what is essentially just a kind of taxonomic paper splitting the material into into three. I mean, I'm not I'm not a big dinosaur guy, apart unless they're stop motion or selling chewits. I don't really care. I thought there was always always more than one tyrannosaur species. Well, okay, let's, did... so let's sum up what the paper we're talking about here is. Okay. Ross, have you read the paper? I haven't read the paper. I've just. I haven't even read the entire abstract yet. I have it open. <laughs> <laughs> That's still more than me. Basically, it's a paper suggesting that Tyrannosaurus rex should be divided into three separate species. There is an earlier species, uh, which over a million years or so diverged into two separate species. So they're calling the older species Tyrannosaurus imperator, I think. And then the two daughter species, which it divides into, they're calling Tyrannosaurus rex and Tyrannosaurus regina, uh, which I like the names. Tyrannosaurus Mm, emperor is the old one, and then Tyrannosaurus king and Tyrannosaurus queen. Uh, That's cool naming, but I guess it comes down to the lumper splitter debate in the end, right? Yep. Which, if this was human paleontology going on here, this would be no question that it's three species, and they'd probably be trying to divide that into about a dozen other species. <laughs> uh, so yeah. I think that human paleontology are the most splitter splittery of all of the paleontology. Splitters, yeah. I agree that um, I-, I thought that there were other Tyrannosaurus species before too, which I guess well, that maybe what it has is been is that- settled and they've... There's more than one Tyrannosaurus species, so Tyrannosaurus is, is the genus, and then this is T-Rex is being split into three. I think that's what it's saying. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's also, I mean, there's, my, my understanding is there's been lots of controversy in kind of Tyrannosaur circles for years, and again, I say this mm-hmm. as somebody with only a kind of passing acquaintance with, with the whole issue, but the, the idea, of, there's uh, something called Nanotyrannus, uh, which is mm-hmm. like a, a small version of Tyrannosaurus, which some 
lumpers want to just include as a juvenile Tyrannosaurus and splitters mm-hmm. want to have as a separate uh, relative. Um, and mm-hmm. a, a, a lot of it comes down to, you know, paucity of material that there's just not very much um, in terms of kind of ontogenetic uh, developments, stages that they can separate out what is, you know, a small separate uh, kind of lineage from what is just a juvenile of, of the already known um, species. Yeah. And triceratops have that too. Where they, yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, things, lots of yeah. lots of things. And you know, whenever these kind of questions come up, I think of, of MOA, which are these kind of giant birds from New Zealand, which only went extinct like 300 years ago. And there's, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of bones of them. They're like common as muck in, in New Zealand. Uh, and until about 20 years ago, there was like, they were named as 30 different species. Um, there was, for instance, uh, in one genus, there was three different species uh, over the North and South Island of, of New Zealand. Uh, and, and we're talking about, you know, we have everything from egg to, you know, old age adults and everything in between. Uh, but they got that totally wrong. It was only with DNA coming in that they were able to kind of filter it down to about 11 species. Uh, and those mm-hmm. three species are actually two, but they come in three different size classes because the males and the females are massively different in size. You have, mm-hmm. uh, on the Southern Island, you have giant uh, females and very small males because of the sexual dimorphism. And that's one species on the South Island. And then on the North Island, you have uh, fairly big females and small males as well. And so it, it's completely, uh, the bones tell you, if you're just looking at bone sizes and morphology, then you get completely confused. It's only with the genetics that you're able to, to make sense of it. And you know this is where you have even tens of thousands of bones. And then you have, by comparison, you know, Tyrannosaurus systematics, where you have like a dozen bones uh, over 20 million years worth or, or something like that. Um, maybe I'm just too conservative, but I always think it makes more sense to, to be a lumper than a, than a splitter. Yeah, I don't know. I change my mind all the time. Hmm. <laughs> There was a, another previous Tyrannosaurus uh, that uh, was called Tyrannosaurus batar, uh, mm-hmm. which is the one I always think of, but mm-hmm. uh, that one looks like it's been reclassified to Tarbosaurus. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think that uh, most people are considering that to be a Tyrannosaurus anymore. That's the, that's the one from Mongolia, isn't it? That's, there's been a whole bunch of controversy over uh, illegal sailing of, of specimens. Um, yeah. That one. But if we want to talk about lumping and splitting, we could tie it into the film by talking about horses, because you know horses are a really good example of of these kind of questions. So you've got you know classically um, right from the get go, just after Darwin published uh, Theory of Evolution, you have T. H. Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, one of his good friends and strong pro- proponents of of uh, evolution by natural selection, using the evolution of the horse as a as a good example of of how things change through time. And you have this classic, you know, almost as classic as the, the, the kind of evolution of man uh, timeline going from hunched over a kind of chimp to upright uh, European, you know, totally wrong, totally debunked. This is exactly the same thing happened with horses where you go from, you know, very small Eohippus with its three toes to bigger uh, horses like um, uh, Hipparion and, and other ones, which have more, uh, more pronounced middle toes with just the, the two toes at the side off the ground all the way up to finally enormous horses with just the, the kind of one toe that's become the hoof. And again, like with the human uh, kind of diagram, that's totally debunked. We know that evolution doesn't happen in a straight line. All of these are on kind of branches like a big uh, bushy kind of tree. But, you know, Eohippus was a real animal, which is cool right at the beginning. And you have problems with, with lumping and splitting in the horse family tree as well. So just North American horses, for instance, until fairly recently, they've been a, a total mess with like dozens of different named species varying by small amounts. But they're sort of starting to figure that out now. And you've got just normal horses like the domestic horse you have in North America. And that, that's kind of where, where their, their home is. You have Hippidian, which is a kind of really bizarre, weird-nosed South American horse, which lives until the end of the Pleistocene. And you've also got uh, something called the New World Stilt-Legged Horse, which is um, a close relative of the, the horse that we've domesticated, but has differences in skull morphology and in kind of leg morphology as well. And they, they live until the end of the Pleistocene too. Cool. So was the Dawn Horse in 
um, North America? Yes, I think so. I mean, horses evolve in, in North America. I'm going to quickly look that up while no one's paying any attention to what I'm saying. Um, but I, th- I think everything before Equus, yeah, is in North America. And then uh, and things like... North America. Yeah, things like... Or um, in the Americas. Things like uh, the zebra, the ancestors of the zebras and the ancestors of the of the asses and onagers and kiangs, uh, they're a fairly late movement from North America into Eurasia over the Bering Land Bridge. Um, but the most most diversity of horses is in the Americas, which is pretty cool. Until humans uh, killed them off and then had to bring them yeah. back over. Yeah, which again is another interesting question. You know, if you're going to get into why the Pleistocene megafauna went extinct, you're going to have to also answer why it is that the exact same species of horse, so Equus caballus, the, the domestic horse that we, we have all around the world now, they died out in the Americas at the same time as mammoths and saber-toothed cats and ground sloths and all the rest of it. But when they were brought over by the, the Spaniards in, in the 15th century, they thrived. And now you know, the, the population of uh, mustangs Wild feral horses in the Americas is enormous, so obviously, you know the, the kind of ecosystem can support them. Yeah, it wasn't anything stopping them from from uh, from living in the Americas. It must be must be something else. It's humans, isn't it? I thought that was pretty well accepted. That but... well, yeah, it's accepted by me uh, and, and many yeah, other folks. Okay. But there's yeah. there's always folks disagree. Fascinating. You should write a book on that. <laughs> I'm trying to. <laughs> There is a really good book called The Tyrannosaur Chronicles, which is quite interesting, about all about tyrannosaurs. Yeah, Dave Hone, he's he's a mm-hmm. great uh, writer and uh, you know an acknowledged expert on everything tyrannosaur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good pop pop side book. And I really appreciate Josh that you found uh, the YouTube adverts for Chewits for uh, to go alongside <laughs> the the Caveman uh, podcast. I spent about half an hour just watching old Chewitt's adverts the other day uh, and having a bit of a nostalgia flashback. Is that on our site? Yeah, if you go to... It's posted check- in, the, in the podcast notes from the last episode. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'd never heard of Chewitt's before, but uh, I like that monster. That's not a sweet you get in Canada? I don't think so, Kim. Yeah, have you ever so. seen it? No. Did you ever have them when you were in the UK, Kim? Uh, I don't think so. I'm not really a candy uh-huh. person. Okay. Gotta have chocolate in it, or else. Yeah, um, I'll maybe not worth the source some and see if I can send them out to you guys. I'm a long ways away now. Are you? I mean, you're probably just as far from where I am uh, as you were in Canada, just in the opposite direction. You think? Yeah. Maybe. Don't know. I could Google Map it. <laughs> I'm always so surprised at how far away I am right now. Because even like I keep thinking, oh, I'll just hop over to Vietnam, and then I look, and it's like a seven-hour flight, and you're like, ah, it must be a small plane, though. So this is unrelated to paleontology or Stone Age or anything like that. But it occurred to me towards the end of this movie that the whole impetus for the plot was this guy showed up to town to track down his old girlfriend because some client of his wanted to buy her horse specifically. And that's the reason this whole like her horse was so special that he had to track her down across Mexico with a traveling circus. Yeah, wild Bill wanted, wanted to, to buy, buy her horse. Wild Bill did. <laughs> yeah, like sure that horse was jumping off of a a diving board into a pool. I guess it's a pretty special horse, but <laughs> <laughs> seems like a pretty flimsy pretext to get them together in the first place. Well, I also thought. If what she was doing is dangerous, which it is for her and the horse, I don't know how she didn't get trampled in the in the thing and how just I don't all of it. They both should just have died. But so it's pretty dangerous. And then he shows up like her ex lover and stands right where she can see him. Like she, obviously she's going to get frazzled. That's so dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. You hear or I think I've heard, you know, actual uh, stories of of uh, spurned um, acrobat artists and stuff who who kind of glare from the from the uh, the circus crowd and and then their ex partner you know has a, a fatal slip. Um, yeah, because you know, you're these you're, are these are kind of Agatha Christie style um, scenarios. Yeah, but you know, like you say, I mean, how special is that horse? I mean, obviously, this is before the days of television and, and mass entertainment. But I mean, how many people would go and see? A woman jumping off a three-story tower 
on a horse through a ring of fire into uh, a bucket of water. I don't know. It's definitely only something you'd be able to watch once at either, right? Like it, people yeah. aren't going again and again. It's, it's not got a lot of repeat value. <laughs> no. Unless I would you know, go like, to see the tiny horse dance, so oh, yeah, I for sure. see over and over. But, but maybe it's like Formula One. People don't watch it for the actual spectacle. They watch for hoping it's going to go horribly wrong. Uh. <laughs> it would have to. Like this pool was not very deep and this horse, like can a horse, how much water would a horse need to jump into to not die? Like, break its it would leg. have to be deeper than that pool, right? Yes. Yeah. And then when they, after they finished jumping, half the water was gone already. So it wasn't very deep. Yeah. But I think this was a real thing. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've heard stories of, you know, diving horses as a real circus phenomenon. Um, you know, I think this is probably back in the day when horses were cheap. It's a, so, you know, it didn't matter if they only ever did it once. You just get a new oh. horse in. I mean, that also doesn't make sense. You know, why bother getting a, chasing a, a kind of special horse all the way over Mexico when you know you could buy half a dozen horses and just push them off? I know I don't think it did have a you know the Humane Society of America confirms that no animals were harmed in the making of this picture at the end, did it? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. And you know, the, one of the reasons the Humane Society came in to uh, protect animals on films was that some early cowboy film I can't remember its name, but they. They had a, a big scene where uh, a whole bunch of horses were chased off a cliff to their death. <gasps> and instead of using any special effects, they just bought a whole bunch of horses and chased them over the cliff and filmed it as they, oh, as they disgusting. plummeted to their death. And that was, that was just a bit too much for yeah. the film goers of America. That's horrible. Mm. I appreciated that at least the, the elephant that got killed was fake. Yeah. But <laughs> it kind of pissed me off because, I mean, so when Allosaurus gets out and Guanji gets out, it's hilarious because everybody's running, but then there's always, no matter how long it's been that he's out for, there's still people kind of running around. Like, you're like, where have where have you been? Just sitting and watching, <laughs> and now you've decided to go? But the guy that was in charge of the elephant was kept the elephant in that corner, which, one, you would not be able to keep an elephant in the corner if there's an allosaurus coming out after it. But it, he kept the elephant in the corner. He didn't let it get escape. And then finally, at the end, he was like, ah, oh, and then he ran away. So the elephant was just like, a buffet style just right there. Yeah. That was me. It was quite weird because the, 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 there's an elephant, a real elephant in the in the kind of first scenes of the film when they, the circus kind of comes to town. Uh, mm. And then they kind of switch over to, you know, you can clearly tell it's a stop motion, the elephant in the, the kind of final scenes. And mm -hmm. you're like, why? I was thinking, why are they, why is the elephant stop motion when mm -hmm. they could just have a normal elephant do the tricks? But then it makes sense when you have the elephant fighting the Allosaurus um, towards the end. But, I mean, God, one thing that really jarred me was the noises the elephant was making. I, mean, I know. I don't know who was the Foley artist for that, but they'd never heard an elephant make any noise because it was like, yeah, I can't even explain how weird it was. It wasn't trumpeting. It, yeah, it, it was wasn't. Strange. No. It was, it was, it was a whole like different a, animal. Like a screaming type of thing. Yeah. And the elephant knew something was wrong way before the humans did. Like the elephant <laughs> was like, no, the allosaurus, can you not hear the metal clanking? It's getting out. <laughs> Yeah, I just thought too many horses fell and too many dinosaurs were killed. But otherwise, it was a good movie. So, how would we rank this one on a scale of 10,000 BC to Encino Man? Oh, it's hard to say because, like, I quite I, I did enjoy it, but then it's hard to say because it's probably getting a higher mark just because the ones that we've watched recently have been so bad. Yeah, I'd give it maybe a uh, a third of an Encino Man. <laughs> so three and a half. Yeah, something like that. Well, maybe maybe a more generous half an Encino Man. Yeah, I would give it a five out of ten, something like that. Okay, so I gave Cave Man a five, so I can't. So I would give this one oh. like um, I'd give it a seven, but that seems too high. So maybe I'll adjust my Cave Man to a three. <laughs> Can we do that? Give Is this that one allowed? A six. <laughs> yes, we make a rule. <laughs> it has a six point two on uh, IMDb, so that's not bad. It's about in the right area. Yeah. Any. Final thoughts about this one? Definitely worth watching, I think. And, mm -hmm. you know, with, with a view to how it clearly has influenced later films, I think it's probably worth, worth seeing. Yeah, and the special effects are amazing. What year was uh, One Million Years BC? Because it's the. Mm. Both the dinosaurs were done by Ray Harryhausen, but I feel like the dinosaurs in One Million Years BC were a little more 
a little a little more refined and also they interacted directly with them more i was more impressed about how the actual people on screen were interacting with the dinosaurs in the same shot in that one yeah. whereas they were a little more separated in this one yeah i, I agree yeah. so one million years came out in uh, 1966 so three years before this one but yeah i think possibly there was more of a time constraint on uh valley of the guanji than there was on one million years bc and you can see that it, well in one million years bc had that that famous woman too right so it, i think it had a hot, bigger raquel um, welch budget yeah it have had a higher budget i don't think there's any big names in this one except for um dollar store uh charlton heston yeah i so i think the worst movie we've seen for me is either william or that ancient aliens one which ancient aliens one Oh, 10,000 BC? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> William is not as bad as that one. No, I no. liked William a little bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. 10,000 BC still worse for me, or Caveman's pretty bad. I mean, there's so many bad ones. They all kind of blend together. It's all these films where Caveman gets banished and then goes off and has adventures and comes back. Mm-hmm. I feel like most of them have something redeemable, but uh, especially as we go back in time, they um, have some more and more problematic aspects that are hard to overlook yeah yeah well that's why alfie is a good remake of that um, trope right they did a good deal alfie sorry what you didn't watch alpha alpha all right yeah. <laughs> that's just about it but see you know, alfie is very problematic <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is very problematic <laughs> <laughs> If you've been enjoying Screens of the Stone Age, get in touch with us. Follow us on Twitter at SOTSA underscore podcast and on Facebook at SOTSA podcast. Or send us an email to screensofthestoneage at gmail.com. Screens of the Stone Age is supported by the Paleoanthropological Society of Canada. Find out more at pasc-scpa.ca.